This meeting is being recorded. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand mutual versus open. You mean closed in versus open in? Is that what you mean? There you go. So they, yeah, that's very testable. That's testable on all exams. That's testable on the SIE, the seven, the 65, the 66. That's testable for everybody. Anything else they want to put in the chat? Uh, yes, we can do that. We can talk about taxes, but taxes are usually in the context of the vehicle that you would be looking at. Hey, Dean, these classes that you're teaching in, uh, in April, can we join those too? Yeah, it's Kaplan. You got to go through Kaplan to, to get involved in those classes. But yeah, there I'm on the Kaplan schedule as the instructor for those classes. The seven would be, I think it will not fit for your, uh, where you're going to gonna be in terms of your test date, but you're welcome to join me. Uh, can you guys uh, see my screen? Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. No. Anybody out there? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we got mutual funds. We got rule one forty four, rule one forty seven. Let me just take care of that, Clyde, uh, right right away. So, you know, rule one forty four is about how we turn unregistered securities into registered securities, right? So I say, Clyde, how did you get these securities? You didn't get them in a public marketplace because they have these red letters on the certificate that says stop transfer. And there's a legend on these stocks. Now, even though you may go through your whole career and not see a stock certificate, I assure you they exist. So, you know, unregistered stock is stock you got directly from the issuer. And after you've held it for six months, you can file Form 144. Form 144 is how we turn unregistered stock into registered stock. And the first thing is you have to have held the unregistered stock for six months. Then you can file the form. Now, Clyde, there are some people that are called control persons, and all the stock they own is the control stock. So, for example, uh, Elon had asked uh, Larry Ellison to join the board of Tesla. And so uh, he said, yeah, I'll, I'll be a board member. And he was elected to the board. And to show his support, he bought 5 million shares of Tesla in the public marketplace. He, you know, called his broker and said, hey, buy 5 million shares of Tesla. That stock is not restricted. He also received a million shares in Tesla stock for sitting on the board. That came directly from the Tesla. So he has two types of stock. He has registered stock, the 5 million shares he bought in the open market, plus the million shares he got for serving on the board for a total of 6 million shares. Now, regardless how a control person comes up with the stock, all that stock is called control stock. That's all the stock owned by officers, directors, and principal stockholders. All that stock is called control stock. Regardless of how they got it, those folks might have to always file Form 144. Always. Whether it's restricted or not. Now, if it was restricted, unregistered, restricted means restricted transfer, they further would have to have held it for six months. Larry doesn't have to hold the 5 million shares that he bought in the open market for six months, but the million shares he does. Now, during the period of that form, you have to file very testable at or prior. So Form 144 is filed at or prior to the sale. And you can sell in that 90-day period, test question, 1% of the outstanding stock or the average last four weeks trading volume, whichever is greater. I think a great memory aid device is 144. 144. I can sell 1% of the outstanding stock or the average of the last four weeks trading volume, whichever is greater. Not testable, Clyde, but when you sell, you have to file Form 4 telling you you did that. When I was a broker, I made a lot of money filing Form 144s. You know, I'd file that form, see the guy file it. I'd call him say, hey, Clyde, Dean here. <laughs> Every once in a while, somebody say, how'd you know I'm liquid? I said, I saw your Form 144. They go, is that public information? I go, it most certainly is. <laughs> I got some ideas what we can do with the money, right? So that's what 144 is about. 147, test question, 
is an interstate offering of securities. It's an exempt transaction under 33. It's not exempt with the state administrator. I'm still have to register with the state. So I tell uh, the SEC says, Dean, did you sell the brand new securities to the public? I said, I did. And they said, you didn't register the security? I said, I did not. You didn't register under 33? I said, no. They said, what safe harbor? That's the legal term for ways to do things, right? You know, if, for example, if I'm going to grow pot or have a dispensary, I need to know what are the safe harbors available to me? What are the ways I can do this without getting in trouble? And uh, I say, I avail myself of a safe harbor called 147. And so to avail myself of that safe harbor, that exempt transaction under 33, I'm going to have to have a business. The issuer has to have 80% of their business and assets within the state. We only can sell it to residents of that state. Now, once the residents of that state have held it for six months, they can sell it to someone else. And that's called a Rule 147 exemption. Now, be careful. I'm still going to have to register that with the state administrator using what's called qualification. So I asked the state administrator, I want to sell this in your state. I'm not registering it with the SEC. What do I got to do to qualify? And then they tell me, and whatever I do, I say, thank you very much. Now, I don't know what exam you're taking, Clyde, if you're taking the SIE. Uh, 147A lets you use contiguous states. I haven't had anybody tell me on debrief they've seen 147A, but that just uh, lets you do that. Uh, 606, I'd need the context, era, Erica, of 606 and 611 about what they're doing. They don't typically ask you rule numbers. They just ask you to, you know, under rule 147. So I have no idea uh, what, what they want to know about 606 or 611. Again, you'd have to send me whatever it is you're looking at. Okay, so anything else beside uh, before we get started on closed end versus open end? 65, okay, so Clyde, I just want to give you some more information then because on the 65, I just brought up this thing called qualification, Clyde. And so, uh, well, taxes, I can do that real quick, but uh, Clyde, make sure through that qualification, all the registrations you get asked on, on your 65, Clyde, December 31st is when they need to be renewed. The exception is what we just discussed. So when I qualify that investment with the state administrator, that rule 147, my registration for that security is good for 12 months, one year. It's the only registration on 65 is not associated with December 31st. It's for one year from the effective date. That's how long I have now to go try and sell those investments to residents of that state. Now, if it's 12 months has come and gone, I can ask the state administrator to extend my registration period, give me more time to sell it. And then the test question there is I can't change the terms of the offering. So if the state administrator says, yeah, Dean, I, you know, I check in with the state administrator and say, hey, I told you I was going to raise eight to $12 million. I'm at 10. I, I think I can sell the other two. Can I have some more time to do so? And assuming they say, okay, then I say, you know, uh, you know, he says, Dean, are you changing the terms? And I better say no, because if I'm changing the terms, I can't, you know, extend that. All right. So REITs and taxes. Uh, Erica, very test will know that REITs and mutual funds have to pass through 90% of their net investment income. They don't pass through losses. They just pass through income. So that's very testable about REITs. And then you would pay the tax on whatever the REIT passes through to you, right? So REITs and taxes, that's the tax consequences of REIT. You buy a REIT for the same reason that you buy a mutual fund, professional management, diversification, and ease of ownership. All right, so let's uh, contrast these uh, type of mutual funds. And here's my all-time favorite slide. My all-time favorite slide. You have to be able to do this on the exam. So we're gonna go down the left-hand side and then we're gonna go down the right-hand side. Now I know there's 400 videos in my YouTube channel and it's like tonight on the live stream, I put some of the videos I told I would, I haven't time stamped it yet, but I put them there. And uh, this video, I have entire videos on closed end and open end. So, you know, you should probably shop the, you know, playlist and find these videos. I have entire videos with a thumbnail that says closed in and open in and it's spot on for the exam. These are open sessions, so I don't mind going over it. And as I know, 400 videos, you're probably not gonna have time to watch all of them. Uh, this is very testable on the SIE. It's testable on the seven, it's testable on the 65, and it's testable on the 66. An open end fund is continually offering new shares to the public. So that means not only are we gonna to have to comply with the Investment Company Act of 1940, what other act are we going to have to comply with if we're selling brand new securities to the public? 
besides the Investment Company Act of 1940. Securities Act of 1933. You got it. Good job. Good job. Now, by the way, Clyde, test for you. I told you this test wherever to Clyde on your 65. This is a federally covered security. Mutual funds are federally covered. And that means, Clyde, I don't have to register this open end fund with the state administrator. Right? Federally covered securities are mutual funds, New York Stock Exchange, a NASDAQ, and uh, exempt transactions. So we're going to give you a perspective so you can make an informed decision. Now, the great thing about a mutual fund, an open-end mutual fund, we're going down the left side, then we're going down the right side, is an open-end mutual fund you can uh, redeem anytime you want based on the next calculation of the NAV. So they have pretty good guaranteed marketability at the next calculation of the NAV. So uh, you say, Dean, how, many uh, how much money am I going to get? I said, well, I don't know, Erica, because it's based on the next time they do the uh, calculation of an AV. They do that test question once per business day. So what is the idea that getting into the fund? I say, Eric, I don't know how many shares you're going to get because it's based on the next calculation of the NAV. Erica gets out, she redeems. I say, I don't know how much money you're going to get because it's based on the next calculation of the NAV. What is that called, test question? This idea that we're always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV. Very testable. It's called forward pricing. Forward pricing. So very testable. We're always doing business based on the next calculation. Now, open-end mutual funds are only allowed to issue one class of stock. What we mean by that one class of equities, they can't issue preferred stock. All they can issue is common stock. You know, they might have A shares and B shares and C shares, but that's about the load. So all the only thing they got is common stock. Now, when we contrast that, we'll find out that's different than a closed-end fund. They don't trade in the secondary market. They trade test question. The issuer, the open end fund, is receiving the money. So what kind of a market or trade do we call that when the issuer receives the money and not the previous owner? What market is that? Right on, Erica. That's the primary market. Good job. So this is a primary transaction. They're priced by a formula. That formula is NAV plus sales charge equals public offering price. The NAV plus the sales charge equals the public offering price. And then the maximum we can charge, that too is a test question. The maximum we can charge is 8.5%. I don't know of any fund charging 8.5%. That would be the maximum load. Now, remember your X date, all that time you spent on DERP, declared X payable, was based on there being a secondary market. And an open-end mutual fund knows who their shareholders are at any given time. So in an open-end mutual fund, all of the dates are set by the board of directors. The declared date, the record date, the X date, the payable date. And here the X date is typically the day after the record date. Wow, that's a little different. That's a little different. So RTFQ, and whether it's an open-end or closed-end fund or whether it's a stock, if I call Erica, I say, hey, Erica, you should buy today, man, because you buy today, you get the dividend. And if you wait till tomorrow, no dividend for you. She says, well, Dean, isn't it going down by the amount of the dividend? Isn't that just uh, creating an unnecessary tax situation? Could I call to your supervisor? Could I talk to your supervisor? Uh, what's that called when we use the artifice, the artificial sense of urgency, artificial because there is no sense of urgency, to uh, get somebody to make a move and buy the, uh, the stock? Right on, Eric. It's called selling dividends, and it's a big no-no, right? So it's not good if you pass your test and you go back to your supervisor and say, I want to sell some dividends, do some breakpoint sales, do some front running, open some fictitious accounts. Now, those are all bad things that you're not supposed to do. All right, now we're going to contrast that with a closed-end company. A closed-end company does a one-time initial public offering. So there's no prospectus at the IPO. The shares are not redeemable. You know, um, I'm not a good prospect for a, a domestic mutual fund, and here's why. You know, when I was a practitioner and I'm selling mutual funds, I would say, uh, listen, do you have the time, temperament, and expertise to be managing money? And the vast majority of people that I may ask that question to are going to say no. And I'm saying, well, you know, what you should consider is hiring a professional money manager. 
And they say, Dean, can I hire a professional, a professional money manager with as little as $500? I go, there are men and women who sold their soul to manage that $500 for you. And I'm going to recommend a mutual. Now, if you ask me, Dean, do you have the time, timber, and expertise to be managing money? I'm going to say yes. I don't need to pay somebody to do that for me. I'd be the first to say that there are some areas where I probably should have some assets allocated where I don't have the time, temper, and expertise. Uh, one of those uh, areas is Mexico. And if I wanna make an asset allocation to Mexico, one way I could do it is through a closed end fund called the Mexico Fund, MXF. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange like a stock. And I don't want my manager to have to liquidate investments to meet redemptions. The Mexican market is very volatile. We say, listen, you can't handle the heat in the kitchen. Then you sell your securities, your closed end fund shares to someone else for more than or less than you originally paid. Now, if the Mexico fund chose to, the Mexico fund could issue preferred stock, promise the preferred stockholders 6%, take the proceeds, make additional investments in Mexico. If the Mexico fund chose to, it could issue bonds, 8% debentures, take the money, make investments in uh, Mexico. Be careful, ladies and gentlemen. Open-end funds, we said, can't issue preferred, can't issue bonds. They can certainly own them, but they can't issue them. Whereas closed-end funds can. The biggest testable distinction between the two, closed-end funds trade supply and demand. They trade like a stock. So just like buying a stock, you call your broker, and say buy a thousand shares MXF at the market or buy a thousand shares MSF at a limit order, whatever the case may be. And because there's a secondary market, it's derp. And the X date is one business day prior to record. Now I'm not doing the full version of this that I do in the 45 minute uh, video. In the 45 minute video, yeah, I go into a lot more depth and I actually show you how to calculate POP and how to calculate NAV and do all those kind of nifty things. Uh, any questions on this in terms of uh, uh, the test issues on those? Okay, anything else you guys want to talk about in this overtime session? I think, Eric, I talked about REITs. Didn't I just tell you what REITs are about and the taxation of those? I think I did. Is there something I'm not saying that you want me to elaborate on? It's pretty straightforward. REITs. Right. Uh, ETNs, ETFs are very testable. So what you have to be able to do on the test is contrast an ETF with an ETN. Okay, so here's an exchange rate of fund. So let's start with the first thing here. Oh, come on. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so. The first testable issue about ETFs is can you contrast, just like before, the test is a lot of contrasting. So we had contrasted an open-end fund with a closed-end fund, and they really torment you on your exam about how things are different. And there are some things that people don't like about open-end mutual funds. You know, a lot of people don't like this idea that we're going to be calculating the NAV and forward pricing. A lot of people don't like that you can't buy it on margin because you're not allowed to buy new issues on margin. An open-end fund is continually offering new shares. And, you know, it's a new issue 30 days from the effective date, and people don't like that. Uh, so a lot of people don't like that they're not very tax efficient because the manager is buying and selling securities. You know, so there's additional costs. And so, you know, what you got to be able to do, as I've said, is contrast the open-end fund with an ETF. Now, they're legally classed, classed as open-end investment companies, but that's not the test point. The test point number one is to know that unlike an open-end mutual fund, they're continually priced, right? They trade like a stock. Test question number two, kind of nice. If you want to leverage them, you can. They can be purchased on margin. All short sales must be conducted in a margin account and ETFs can be sold short. 
So you have to be able to contrast this open-end fund thing with an ETF. We said these are generally going to be more tax efficient, right? Because unlike a mutual fund, they rarely are going to be trading securities. You know, it's kind of like on autopilot. It's kind of like passive management. So the assets are professionally selected. They're dumped into the ETF, and then it's going to be trading like a stock. So you're not going to get those distributions, and so it's generally more tax efficient. As we said, uh, it has lower expense and operating costs than an open-end mutual fund. Now, the disadvantage of it, that is it's more a trading vehicle than is an open-end fund. You know, somebody took exception. I have a suitability question. And they said, well, ETFs could be for the long term. And I said, well, given the answer set, that's not the best answer. You know, so, you know, a lot of suitability questions, you have to kind of make a judgment. And, you know, what I'm telling you is that your manager would prefer that you get somebody to give you $500 a month dollar cost averaging in a mutual fund rather than your client's going to be day trading an exchange traded fund. Now, the other point here is they do actually own the underlying securities in the portfolio. There's a custodian. You know, maybe it's State Street Bank and Trust, maybe it's JP Morgan, but they do actually own the securities. So, you know, what you're buying is proportion ownership in that portfolio of securities. You know, that's pretty expensive to do that. ETNs, exchange traded notes, do not own any securities. That's our first major test point. ETNs are a debt instrument. The sponsor agrees to pay you the return of some benchmark. So hopefully it's not Credit Suisse. I'm joking, but not really. <laughs> so, you know, if it was an ETN sponsored by uh, Credit Suisse, ooh, ooh. No, and if it's an exchange trade note, maybe I say I'm going to pay you uh, as a sponsor, the financial institution, whatever the S&P does. So if the S&P SP, goes up 36% and it was 100,000, I owe you 136,000. Now the risk there is default, right? So the exchange traded note, that's the test question. It's not an ownership, it's not an equity. So it's kind of tr tricky. It says equity traded note, but it's, it's a note, it's a debt instrument. And that means you have the risk, credit risk, the risk of default. Uh, dollar cost averaging, very testable. There's lots of mutual fund questions. I think sometimes uh, people you know, don't realize how many mutual funds on all the exams, by the way, on all the exams. So let's see if I have an example here. It doesn't look like I have an example here. So let me get, get, to, get myself a whiteboard. Can you guys see my whiteboard? Yes. Yes. Okay. So first test question. First test question is what makes dollar cost averaging work? And what makes it work is I have to get a customer to give me fixed dollars invested regularly. I'm going to show this to you. The second test question is what's the end result? I'm going to show it to you, but the end result is we're going to end up with a lower average cost than the average price. You know, it's kind of nifty because you're doing exactly what you should be doing, which is buying more shares when they're low and less shares when they're high. It's kind of a built-in kind of a discipline. And then number three is we can't tell somebody this will guarantee them a profit. You know, there's two nasty words we never use in the securities industry. And those words are guaranteed and uh, approved. We never say anything's guaranteed. Okay, so let's say I get a customer to give me $100 a quarter. So test question number one, $100 a quarter means that I can now show him an example of dollar cost averaging. All right, so uh, the uh, client gives me, uh, let's put, a, I'll put it in green and gives me $100. And let's say when he gives me this first $100, the uh, public offering price is uh, 10. Now let's make it uh, five. And so he's gonna be able to get uh, 20 shares. Uh, by the way, Clyde, I don't know if you're still around, but uh, you, this is testable for you. You know, if they ask you to do an average sometimes on your 65, it, a lot of times will be this. Or they're gonna ask you to do, you know, this is called a simple arithmetic average. It's, what we call this in kind of math. But anyways, uh, let's put the dollar invested. 
Uh, this is the price. And this is the number of shares. And let's get that going up here. What did I do? Hmm, what happened to my, there we go. Let's change the color. Okay, so now the next time you give me some money, so you're giving me $100 every quarter. And the next time you give me a hundred bucks, uh, now let's say it's $10, the public offering price. Let's put that up there and boom, boom, boom. And so now you get 10 shares, which is kind of cool, right? Because you're doing exactly what you should be doing, which is buying less shares when they're high and more shares when they're high, uh, low, right? That's what you want to do. It's kind of like if you went to the supermarket, you know, if things kept getting marked up, you would probably cut back on your purchases. You know, it's only in securities industry, people like to buy things at higher and higher prices. And you give me a hundred bucks. And now the share price is five, or let's say it's 10 again. Let's say five. And now we get 20 shares. And then the uh, last one is uh, last quarter here. And let's say when we do this, it is uh, 10. And we get 10 shares. Okay, so test number two. So the average share price is we would take these uh, four prices here, we add them up and we get uh, 30 and we divide by four. We find out the average share price is 750. You recall what I said the end result was gonna be? Is that we're gonna have a lower average cost than the underlying shares because we're buying more shares when they're low and less shares when they're high. So we spend $400 and in that $400, we bought, uh, what, 60 shares? And so let's see what our average share price is. And our average share price is gonna be 400 divided by 60. And our average share cost is 666. And that's test question number two. We end up with a lower average cost than that of the underlying shares. And remember what test question number three is? Please note, I have 60 shares of uh, this thing, and it could be more right here. I've made money, but it could be that I lost money. And so we said the test question number two was, the ad is going to be, your average cost can be lower than the shares, and then we can't guarantee a profit. All right. So uh, what else would you like to talk about in the overtime session? By the way, you'd be hard pressed in the real world to convince me that somebody who dollar cost averages for any lengthy period of time is not going to work out okay, but you know. Uh, no, they are not available for purchase. I'm allowed as a independent contractor capital to use capital content in sessions like this, but no, the deck is not available. Uh, you can, uh, if, if you were in a Kaplan class, this would be the class notebook. If you send me, uh, Jesse, when are you testing? I took it last Monday and missed it by one question. Seriously. Okay, so you have some time. So send me an email. And what I will do is send you maybe a copy of the class notes for that. For that, And that's, it's kind of like the slides. It's not the slides, but it's actually what I would be using to lecture if you join me for the three-day class. Okay, so just send me an email and I'll, I'll send you the PDF. Uh, let's see, what else we got? Cost base and options. Be careful on cost base and options. So you know, what I'm trying to tell you is don't get in the weeds on this, Erica. You know, if you tell me you missed the, the test because of cost basis on options, I'm going to say I don't believe you. Uh, I think the thing to remember about options is the three things that can happen to an option. So I'm not asking what can happen to players. I'm asking what can happen to an option contract. Now, a good mnemonic to remember what can happen to option contracts is T. The option contract can be traded. The option contract can be exercised. The option contract can uh, expire. So that's what's going to happen. So at the end of every question, the option contract either got traded, the option contract was exercised, or the option contract expired worthless. So, and you have an option position, what are the two option positions you can have? 
What are the two option positions you can have? Long or short? Yeah. And remember, so if you're going long, you're going to do an opening purchase. Let's uh, make that a smaller font. Right. And so if you do an opening purchase and you're going to trade it, the thing you're going to do is a closing sale. My closing sales are used to eliminate or reduce a long position. And uh, what about uh, a short position? How do we establish that? Sell to open? Yeah, opening sale, sale to open, same thing indeed. And so if we're going to get rid of that, what are we going to do? Closing purchase. Yeah, so let's just try to all options trading. So let's just start with this, Erica. All option trading. So we're looking at the con consequences of this first option event. Trading. And all option trading is short term with one exception. There is only one situation in which we're trading an option and we may qualify for a long-term capital gain. Anybody know what that is? Remember to qualify for a long-term capital gain, you have to be at risk more for more months? than 12 months. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry, I was answering, but I got it wrong. No, that's okay. Anybody got any idea what this is? Oh. Yeah, the leap is the only one. By the way, only long the leap. So leaps are long-term equity appreciation potential securities. And that's the only option, long, it's got to be long, that may qualify for a long-term capital gain. All the other ones are going to be short-term. So whatever we net these two numbers, Erica, the result is going to be a short-term gain or loss. All right, so let's do our opening purchase first. Let's say we bought the option for uh, five. By the way, that would be, I do it per share, but that if it was one contract, that'd be $500. And I do my closing sale for eight. So I made three points or $300. And uh, what is that $300? Is it a short-term gain or a long-term gain? I, I told you all, all options are short-term. And Diego, you're correct. But leaps are 39 months, technically 30 months in practice. There's, there's only one that's long, Erica. The only option that can be a long-term capital gain is leap. So that's 300. They're not going to give you taxes on options, on multiple option strategies, uh, Diego. Uh, you know, but again, it wouldn't matter because it's all short term, as I just said, right? So everything's short term. Let's try it again. So I bought the option at five and I sold it for two. Now, what do I have? Short term loss? Yeah, $300 loss. So trading is pretty straightforward. I would say I did. Uh, Let's say I did an opening sale for eight and I uh, close it out at uh, 10. So I sold it for eight and I buy it back for 10. Uh, really? That's a $2 gain? I don't think so. If you sold that for eight, eight in, and you bought it for 10, that is not a two point gain. That's a two point loss, right? There you go. And again, what kind of loss is it? Short term. Short term. Now, the other thing that can happen to option contract is it can expire, right? So the other thing that can happen is the option contract can expire. So let's look at that one. So yeah, we buy it for five and the option expires worthless. So what is that five points? It's a short-term loss. It's a short-term loss. We buy a uh, sell it for eight and the option expires. What is that eight? Is that a gain? Yeah, it's a short-term gain, right? So you're just going to net the premiums and whatever the, uh, you know, the numbers out versus in is either a gain or a loss. Now, the other thing that can happen is the option can be exercised. And for the most part, for the most part, that would follow, it would follow the break even for the most part. And I'll show you the exceptions in just a little bit. But if you just buy an option contract, like let's say I go buy one Apple 
August 160 call at eight. And I exercise that contract. My break even is 168, and that's my cost basis in the Apple. So for the most part, that follows break even, right? If I buy an Apple 160 put and I exercise, Again, it follows break even. My break even is going to be 152, and that's my cost basis in the stock. So, the only thing where this gets tricky, and again, I'm going way overboard. I think this is way north of what you're going to see on your exam. The only thing that gets tricky is if you have a stock position and you add to it an option. So, let's say I uh, buy 100 shares of Apple. Okay, so you should be able to tell me what is Dean gonna do next. If I have 100 shares of Apple, what kind of option comes next? There's only two choices here about what happens if I'm gonna add a option to this stock. I'm either gonna be trying to generate additional income or I'm gonna be trying to protect the stock position. So I'm either gonna do a covered call, a covered call or a protective put. I'm either doing a covered call or a protective put. If I'm interested in generating additional income, you know, that's very testable suitability. And I say, hey, how would you like to agree to sell high stock you just bought low? Somebody will give you hundreds of dollars in advance to agree to sell stock high you just bought low. Let's do a buy right on Apple. Let's write one Apple uh, August. Uh, 165 call at four. So this is the one time that it doesn't follow break even. So what I mean by that is my cost basis here is going to be 160. And then if that gets uh, called away from me, my sales proceeds are going to be 169. So that's the one that gets a little messy. So in that covered call, the cost base is whatever I paid for the stock and the option is done separately. So now if I get called away, I mean, that's an obligation to sell the Apple, then, you know, that's going to be, uh, the sales breed is going to be 169. Now, the last scenario, the last scenario that we could tax, ask about tax consequences is I buy the put. Now, this becomes important, Eric, about when I buy the put. If I buy this Apple put right out of the gate, again, it's going to be, uh, my break even, which in this case is going to be 163. So if I just buy that put right out of the gate and uh, qualify for a long term capital gain, I'd have to hold it for more than 12 months. But uh, if several weeks later, let's say I uh, don't buy the put, I don't buy the put right out of the gate. Instead, I wait uh, six months later. And so six months later, Dean buys that put. Now I have interrupted the holding period because I have to hold the apple for 12 months, be at risk for 12 months. And once I marry the put to that position, I'm no longer at risk. And so now that resets. I mean, I'm going to have to um, hold it for another, you know, whatever to qualify for a long-term capital gain. So those are all the testable scenarios about taxes. I don't think it's a big deal. You tell me you missed the seven because of taxation on options. I'm going to say, I don't believe you. There was some other problem. It is way, way more testable way more testable to know the strategies and suitability of the options and the break-evens than it is to actually, you know, no taxes. And then remember, test prep vendors kind of go overkill on that. All right, what else? We got a, one more thing before we call it a night. Anything else you well, want to talk about before we call it a night? Can I talk something real quick about the options? Uh, what? Well, options are a big thing. I, you know, that's like four oh. hours. <laughs> I mean, what, what would you like to know about options, Clyde? I mean... If I sell a call, a cover call, and then a stock drops and the option I sold is smaller and I buy it back. Is well, the, the, the key thing to be able to do, Clyde, you won't get, you weren't going to get a whole lot of options on 65, but what you want to be able to do is track the money. So, you okay. know, uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. Some people use pluses and minuses. Uh, you know, some people use, uh, you know, uh, pluses. My, I, use, I use a T. 
So let me just show you here. So let's just put that Apple we just did. We bought 100 shares of Apple at uh, 160. That's going to be money out. I, use, I don't use pluses and minuses. I use dollars out, dollars in. But I'll use the minus sign just because that might be, you know, the way you're doing it. So there's me buying the Apple for 160. And then I think we sold, uh, what was the call we sold? I think we sold a 165 call for four. And so let's put that there. And uh, I think when you get good at a T and tracking the money, your break even becomes a lot more transparent. Because again, the break even will be the number that makes this column balance. Because that's what break even is, same dollars out as dollars in. So the break even here, Clyde, is 156. You can either memorize that or you can get good at a T. You can shop your answer set. You do get four points of price decline protection. And then if you get something kind of gnarly, what you got to be able to do, and that's why I like the T, is you got to be able to close out. So if we're closing that out, we're going to go this way, right? Because if we bought the stock, we're going to sell the stock. And so, you know, if they say several weeks later, you close, sell the stock and you close out the option, that's going to go that way. And so you would just be able to plug, hopefully be able to plug in the numbers. I don't think that's a big deal on your 65. Did you ever take a seven client? Or are you a 660, 365 person or just 65 person? 65. Yeah. So, you know, be careful because this is a, you know, it, you could spend hours on options, maybe four or five option questions and mostly recognition on the 65. If you're, if you're a seven person, this becomes a, it's a little more of a, uh, you know, high risk area. Uh, I will, uh, I linked uh, to the options lecture and I'll link uh, to, the, were you in the live stream, Klein? Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll put my, my options lecture in the live stream replay and you can find it there. And that's, you know, about an hour and a half on basic options. And I think that would be helpful for you. But that's about it. You're, you're, you know, your investment's going to be, and I don't know when your test date, you just said, I think you missed the mark this recently. So I got 30 days, but. Uh, I'll link to that and then stock plus options. So that's about another hour. So you're looking at about three hours to get up to speed uh, efficiently would be what my guess would be. All right, anything else? All right, everybody. Well, like I said, we don't offer the live stream all the time. We uh, offer it. I think we've offered it every Tuesday, except two. Uh, I'm having a cabin built and uh, you know off the grid. So I'm not going to be doing the live stream next Tuesday, but I'll put it back up there. And, uh, you know, the next time it's available, we cap it at 10, unless you're a paid alumni like Erica, then you can always get in like Erica. I've got a link tonight instead of having to go through the, the thing. So uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Have a great night, everybody. And I will see you uh, next time in the next either uh, community live stream or in the types of orders class that's coming up. That's next week. That's $35. Where else might I see you or encounter you? Maybe on the channel somewhere. So uh, I'll see you all next time. Remember, inch by inch, your exam's a cinch. Yard by yard, your exam is hard. You're welcome, Donata. And I'll see you every next time. Bye-bye.